power to give, lift your hands and give praise. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Nothing can prevent you from doing that except you. We had to, one of the songs that said, more of you, more of you, more of you. As we were singing that, I quit singing it. Because this thought rose up in me, where can you go to get more of Him? Either you have Him, or you don't have Him. Jesus said, I am in you, the Father is in me, the very presence of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily, and He's in you, where can you go to get more? You have Him. Then we sang another song, uh, praise Him. Excuse me. Um, I know who I am. Well, I like the English language because a lot of folks misuse the English language. I'm not saying that that song misused it, but there's another aspect. I know who I am but I know whose I am. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. So, to whom do you belong? You belong to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He purchased you with His own blood. He redeemed you or bought you back out of the hand of the enemy. Okay, all that's free. That wasn't even on my notes. That just as I sat over here, those things came to me. Now, how many of you today want to hear the voice of God? Okay, some of you don't want to. Well, maybe you're just too weary to lift your hands. But inside, you ought to at least be saying, I want to hear from God. <laughs> Do you have ears? Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did I read that in the Bible? Yeah. See, you have something to do about that. You can be like those who listen to Stephen. The scripture says they stopped up their ears and rushed on him and killed him. They stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear. So if you want to hear today, that's what we're going to do. Because we're going to look at what's in this book. This is the Word of God. We think, oh, how wonderful it would be if I could just hear the Word of God. When you read it, it speaks to you from these pages. Were Jesus to come here in bodily form and stand in front of you and speak, what he would say would be no more his words than what these are in the book. In the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the Word. So let's begin. Heavenly Father, right now, I offer myself as a living sacrifice to you. It is my reasonable service and my spiritual worship. So use my faculties to speak to these, your precious people, and now Holy Spirit, come 
Open the eyes of our understanding that our hearts might be flooded with your light. We give you praise and thanksgiving for all you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you heard the expression, a false flag? Way, way, way back in the olden days, the different regiments of the army would have their own flag, and the troops were to rally around the flag. If they saw the flag going in a particular direction, they followed the flag. We have, in the United States today, many false flags. We just had one in Boston. That was not a terrorist act from somewhere else. That was the United States government <coughs> who instituted that. For what purpose, you ask? The modus operandi of our enemy is to raise false flags to get you to believe a lie for the purpose of taking away your freedoms from you. He will do that through pain, as the sister said, getting you to believe a lie to lose what God has given you. When uh, Moses led the children out of Egypt, he's facing the Red Sea, and the army is coming behind him. God! He says, what's in your hand? You mean I have something? Absolutely you have something. You have the Word of God, and you can put it in your mouth and use it as a weapon against the enemy. Recognize we do not fight as natural people. We fight a supernatural battle against the enemy with the words of our mouth, so long as the words of our mouth are the words of God. But I'm telling you, in the body of Christ, particularly in the United States, there are many false flags being raised. We want to uh, take a journey there. Let's begin in Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're going to start down here at verse 29. There are some scriptures which you probably don't like. You want to get a pen knife or cut them out of your Bible and throw them away because you don't like those scriptures. Usually you don't like them because they ask you to do something you don't want to do. So here we see, verse 29, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppress the stranger. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Who is it that God is looking for today to stand in the hedge, to stand in the gap in the wall for the United States? Look in the mirror. Yeah, but I'm just one boy, so I don't, I don't have any ability to fight the government. We do not war as one beating the air. We're not shadow boxing. We put God's word in our mouth and we speak His plan. We speak His desire. And He brings it to pass. What has He instructed us to do? Pray for those who are in authority over you. Why? So that you might live a quiet and peaceable life and the word of God will be unhindered as it goes forth. 
there is a move afoot called the New World Order to get rid of the freedom that we have to worship and propagate the gospel. But God is looking to those who know Him to stand up and say, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Do you know what your assignment is? I just spoke. You are to intercede for the nation. God does not want to bring destruction on the United States. But unless there are those who will intercede, it will come. I read just yesterday, you can read a lot of things on the internet, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but what I read came from a man who is high in the intelligence community, very high. He said, he was informed about some dirty bombs that were hidden in the United States, and there are many of them set to go off. Another false flag, terrorism from outside, so that we can declare a state of national emergency, suspend the Constitution, and have a dictatorship. Those are the plans of the enemy. Those are not the plans of God. And we can stand in that gap in the wall and we can prevent it from happening. Some of those bombs have been found and have been defused. Who knows how many? I don't know. Now let's look over in Matthew, over in the New Testament. You know, I had a wonderful sermon already planned, and it was on PowerPoint. I was going to wow you. You would be walking out and saying, Wowzers! <laughs> but this morning, the instant I was awakened, I had some scriptures in mind. <laughs> I didn't put them there! And so, for just a few minutes, I sat down this morning and jotted some things down, and that's what you're getting today, Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to start here in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We have in this nation a great deception going forth from many pulpits. One of those deceptions is well, I know we call this the Word of God, but you can't believe everything that's in here. This was written for a time long ago, and times have changed. Liar! The Word of God is eternal. It changes not. What He said, He said and he will not alter or change the word that's gone out of his mouth. Well, wait a minute. He said to Jonah, I'm going to destroy Nineveh, and then he changed his mind. No, you just quit reading too soon. They repented, but later they fell back into sin, and God destroyed their city. There's an interesting word in here. I never knew you. Adam knew his wife and she conceived. We see that terminology used again and again. 
that knowing speaks of intimacy. There are probably very few in the United States if shown a photograph of the one in the White House who would say, oh, I know who that is. But were you to uh, go knock on the White House door, you're not getting in because he doesn't know you. No intimacy. You can know all about God. You can have memorized much of this word, but still not know him. Historically, you could know all about many of the historical figures, but you don't know them because you have no point of intimacy with them. There are those who go out and preach the Word of God, and many come to Christ through that preaching. You see, God watches over His Word, and when the Word goes forth, God honors His Word. And so the time will come, the Scripture says, they will send the Father. Let us come in, because we look what we have done in your name. He'll say, I'm sorry, I don't know you. And he says that they are lawless. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. Many folks do many great and wonderful things in their own power. And in the world they receive accolades. Kudos. Ooh, what a great thing you've done. But in the kingdom, no one receives the glory but Jesus. Too many in the body of Christ, and I use that word in a generic sense, have this sort of plan. Well, this church over here has that program, and that seems to be working good, so let's us use that plan. And then they institute it, and then it doesn't seem to work, and so they go to another seminar, and they find some other plan, and they say, let's do that. And so they, through expense, institute that plan. And then perhaps after a period of time, they see that's not working. You see, all of that is human effort. Rather than come up with your plan or someone else's plan and then ask God to bless it, find out what God's plan is because it's already blessed. And then when you do it, it works. Amazing! This will be a very sad day for many. Caution! Don't go through the motions of Christianity. Go to church. Even put on a double-breasted suit. <laughs> Look at me. That's not where it's at. It's not those who do outwardly. The Pharisees were great at that. Jesus called them a brood of vipers. He said, you look nice on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're not going to fool God. Not even if your name is Gene Cooper. He sees right through any sort of facade we erect. The wonderful thing about speaking, as I'm doing now, I got it first. You don't see the bruises. <laughs> but let the Word of God speak to you personally. Oh, I know who that sermon's for. No, you don't. You may guess. Remember the old 
Negro spiritual? It's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. There's not a one of us can say, I've arrived! I'm there! <laughs> if you want to know who to follow, I'm there. It is true, the Scripture declares it, that we are living epistles. An epistle was a letter. We speak about the Pauline epistles. They were letters to the churches. The Scripture says that you are a letter and you are read by all men. I remember Clifford said something that just it has never left me. He's at work. His boss likes motorcycles. And so the boss is talking about motorcycles. He loves to talk about motorcycles. Well, Cliff doesn't talk about motorcycles. He talks about Jesus. So he said to this man, I, I, I hope I'm getting it right, the story right, but he says, you're a preacher too. You just preach motorcycles. What are you preaching? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think I can make it. That's not the message to preach. Let me see. Do you have a Bible with you? Second Peter.
and godliness. We have need of two things in life. Those things which have to do with life. Shelter, food, air to breathe, water to drink, all of those things that have to do with life. And godliness. Our relationship horizontally as we walk in the flesh and then our relationship as spirit beings before God. He says, I have given to you all you need for both of those areas. Yeah, but you don't understand. I've got bills coming and I don't have money. Why are you saying your words when you're supposed to put his words in your mouth? Fight the good fight of faith. The good fight is the fight that you win. And he already declares, I have already given it to you. Quit making a liar out of me. Let me just pause for a second there. A little side journey. I have a friend who is now retired, but he was a police officer in Detroit. Then he moved up to Traverse City and worked as a police officer there in the city for many years, but he's now retired. One day, he's sitting in his patrol car a block off of the main drag through Traverse City doing some paperwork, and he hears a crash. He has a window down in the summertime. He knew instantly about where that was. So he flipped his light on and went over there. Sure enough, it would have been a head-on collision. A drunk hit a car head-on. <laughs> so he stopped. He's walking towards the accident. The back door of the sedan opened, and a little boy got out of the car and came running towards him, grabbed him and around the leg, and said, please, officer, don't let my mama die. Being a man filled with the Spirit, he said, my Jesus won't let your mama die. So he took the boy, put him in the car, where he'd be safe. He went to check on the mom. The mom is down under the dash. The dash is crumpled on her. Her eyes are fixed and died with it. And he said, Jesus, I told that little boy that my Jesus would not let his mother die. Don't make me a liar. Then he went to the other vehicle, took care of that man that was there, took him to jail, booked him in went to the hospital thinking, I've got to do the paperwork on this lady that's dead. He got there, inquired, where is the woman who came in dead? There's nobody who came in dead. Well, the woman that was in that accident, oh, we sent her home. <laughs> Hallelujah! He has given to us everything that has to do with life and godliness through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Hebrews chapter 12. surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, 
And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You can go through a lot of sorrow and pain if you can focus on the joy that is ahead. One of the young ladies in my church graduated yesterday from Oak University with her master's degree. I was reflecting on that. Forty years ago, I graduated with my master's degree from Oakland University. Oh, but I'm telling you, I was so sick of school. <laughs> I didn't ever want to open another book. But for the joy that was ahead of me, I persevered. And that was for a temporal blessing. We have for us an eternal blessing. I know your body wants to do stuff. What does the scripture say? In the last days, men will be loved for pleasure more than lovers of God. Heady, high-minded, goes on and on and on about that. Your body wants to go to Comerica Park, watch the Tigers play a winning game, and eat a bunch of dogs and drink some sodas. And because you want to do that, you will make it happen. I'm sorry, Pastor. Uh, I have a enga previous engagement. <laughs> I probably don't need to say a whole lot about this because these words are very plain and clear in our understanding. Let us, you're in charge of that, let us lay aside every weight. Way, way, way back. I was probably 10 years old. My mom had a little book. I didn't remember the name of it anymore. I still see the pictures in my mind. This little kid kept attaching little lead weights to his clothing. And then he would jump and jump and jump. Then he'd add more weight and jump and jump and jump. Then one day he took all the weights off and he jumped and he went, Wee! <laughs> Want to win the high jump? If you're weighted down, it's going to be hard for you to go up. So lay aside. Though sin, it is a weight. It's not all of the weight, but it is a weight. Grumbling, complaining, those are weights. Speaking the words of the enemy rather than the words of God, those are weights. Put all of that stuff aside, which so easily ensnares us, you know, we don't even think about it sometimes. The words just jump in your mouth and you get they sneak out before you can shut them off. You say things that you ought not to say. And let us run with endurance. Endurance. I don't like that word. I know. Endurance means you have to keep pushing on when you don't want to. Run with endurance. The race that is set before us. The key looking unto Jesus. Many years ago, I was in India. It was, uh, my team there said, you're going to speak today. I had no message, but I stood up and gave a greeting to the church. And while my interpreter was saying that, the Holy Spirit said, teach them the lesson of the sunflower. <laughs> I said to myself, what's the lesson of the sunflower? You know, no sooner had I thought that thought 
then the Holy Spirit told me what the lesson of the sunflower is. It's amazing. Everyone should know this. You plant some sunflowers. When the sun rises in the east, you will note that the face of the sunflower is facing the sun. And then you go out in the evening as the sun sets, and you look over here in the west, there's the sun setting, and you look at that sunflower, it's facing the sun. No matter what the weather is during the day, no matter the obstacles, the wind, the squirrels, it doesn't make a difference. The sunflower faces the sun and follows the sun and tracks the sun we ought also not to be distracted and discouraged by the things that happen around us, but keep our focus on the sun. Not the S-U-N in the heavens, but the Son of God. Back in the olden days, for 27 years I taught driver's education. Now you understand where all my hair went. <laughs> but one of the things that I noticed in teaching driver's education, as long as the students kept their eye on the road, they pretty much were able to keep the car in the lane. But as they became a little more accustomed to driving, their eyes began to wander. The guys would happen to see these beautiful young ladies and they would go, oh. <laughs> and as they looked in that direction, the steering wheel involuntarily turned in that direction. And I would have to reach over and make adjustments. Likewise with the young ladies. They never saw guys. They saw hot guys. <laughs> and likewise with them. Where you focus, you end up going. Lay aside the sin and those things which so easily distract us. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus. Then over to verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto bloodshed striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Um. A lot of times during the day I was seated in my nice leather chair with my laptop on my lap. I do my email there. I do my Facebook there. But then I I have spider solitaire on that computer as well. And he keeps saying, play me, play me, play me. I, okay, just one. Well, the one becomes two, and the two becomes three, and so forth. Reminds me of the man who was uh, enslaved to drinking alcoholic beverages. And so his wife would never let him have any money because she knew exactly what would happen to it. But he was suffering lumbago or something else, and uh, complained, complained, so she made a doctor's appointment for him. Handed him the money, sternly warned him, don't you stop off anywhere on the way, you go straight to the doctor. That money is for the doctor. Okay. But as he was walking towards the appointment, he got thirsty. I'll just stop and have one drink and then I'll go straight to the doctor. Well, the one drink became two and the two became three and soon the money was gone and he still hadn't been to the doctor. <laughs> He's in big trouble now. Because he knew as soon as I get home, 
the missus, first words out of her mouth will be, what the doctor says is wrong with you. i got to come up with something. So he's walking down the sidewalk, kicking cans, and what, I wonder, what am I going to do? Ah! Salvation. There was a music store. Big poster in the window of the music store. The poster said, get the latest syncopation by Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. All oh, these guys know how to pick a guitar band. Beautiful music. That's it. I'll tell my wife I'm suffering from syncopation. Well, she won't know what that is. He didn't know what it was. So he got home. Sure enough, first words out of his wife's mouth were, what the doctor says is wrong with you. Oh, the doc says I've got syncopation real bad. She didn't know what that was, so she got the dictionary and looked it up. Single patients, music, an unsteady movement from bar to bar. <laughs> Out of his own mouth. <laughs> Whom the Lord chastens. If you are getting beaten up today, if, don't you lay the blame on Gene Cooper. We said, do you want to hear from God today? Am I saying what he said? Then you take it up with him. The only reason he's talking to you is because he loves you and you are his child. Then in Hebrews over to verse 14, pursue peace with God. All people. Yeah, but you don't know those people I have to work with. Doesn't say that. Pursue peace with all people and the holiness. See, that's another one of those words that a lot of folks would like to take out of their Bible. They just want to go through life and live their life, but here it says you've got to live in holiness. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Oh no. I guess I have a big trouble. I'm going to have to straighten up my life. Forget it. You can't straighten up your life. You can't get good enough to make it into heaven. You have only one hope, and that is God. Cast everything over on the Lord Jesus. Get on your face before Him. God, I can't do this myself. Because you can. But He can do it. Through you. You provide the willing part and He provides the ability part. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Don't fall short. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Well, just this once, I'll do it, and then I'll ask God to forgive me. That's presumption. That, God doesn't make those kind of deals. Now, if you ever have words try to get up in your mouth, <laughs> somebody mouths off to you, and before you can shut your big blab mouth, the words get out. You wish you could bring them back. Certainly, no one in here. <laughs> it's not my brother or my sister but it's me oh Lord standing in the need of prayer don't look at the moment and transgress in the moment because your flesh wants to do it the apostle Paul in writing I don't have the scripture reference but you know it's there he said, I keep my body. I, his spirit man, 
keeps his body, the flesh, under subjection. I tell my body what it's going to do. It's not going to tell me what I'm going to do. Sunday morning rolls around. It's 12 below zero outdoors, and the snow is deep, and the covers are so nice and warm. The coffee is already fresh because you have a set to come on in the morning, and you think, I don't think I'll go to church today. And your body says, that's it. We're not going to church today. <laughs> Or whatever, you fill in the blanks. You write your own story. No. You say, get out of bed, you lazy bones. We're going to church today. And so you kick yourself in the butt, you get out of bed, and you do what you need to do. You take authority over your body. You don't let it run the show. Don't sell yourself short. Romans chapter 5. I'm on a roll here. I'm going to keep going. Okay. Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Wow. I like that. The one man, that was Adam in the garden, introduced sin into God's realm. And as we followed in the human line from Adam on, we became sinners. Then the law was given, and the law makes sin come alive in you. You know that's true. Don't eat the cookies. What does the kid do? Oh, all of a sudden, now he wants a cookie. And with chocolate all over his mouth and the chocolate chip cookies. Have you been in those cookies? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The offenses become larger and larger because we know we're not supposed to do it. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Well, we shouldn't. But this is one of those great deceptions that I begin this message speaking about. It's uh, called a message of hyper-grace. Way beyond the grace that the scripture speaks about, there are those in today's more liberal churches where from the very pulpit they say it doesn't make any difference. You can do whatever you want. Once you have come to Christ, you make Jesus Lord, you can do whatever you want to do. This Paul addressed this here in Romans. He said, God forbid. Grace is not a license to sin. There are those who brag about their drinking bouts and their carousing and their pastors of large churches. It is a great deception. Don't be deceived by the enemy. Revelation chapter 21. Oh, oh, no. This is getting serious now. We're down here to the end. Yeah, we're down here to the end. Revelation chapter 21. Starting in verse 6. And he said to me, It is done. 
am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Are you thirsty? Do you have all of God you want? Well, your body says, don't get too wound up over this Christianity thing. You're too radical. You'll never be too radical for God. It was radical for Jesus to take your sin and mine and take it to the cross and pay your penalty and mine. If you really want to worship God, then give Him praise for what He has done. You know, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, you think that because you are children of Abraham that you've got it made with God. God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Natural stuff doesn't cut it. It's only a true knowing, intimate relationship with God that will make it. But he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What a marvelous thing to comprehend that we could be dare to be called sons and daughters of Almighty God. Yet that's what he says. To as many as believed upon them, to them he gave the power or the authority or the ability to become sons of God. To as many as believed on his name. Wow. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What a promise. One of those great and precious promises that God gave us, that Peter talked about in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 8. Oh, no, why do we have to put this verse in there? But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers. Oh, I'm glad I don't get in witchcraft. I wonder what my horoscope says today. <laughs> witchcraft! Don't go there. Idolaters. Well, I'm glad I'm not like others. I don't bow down in front of idols and worship. I wonder, wonder how my account's doing. I better check the uh, stock market. Oh, not a day goes by. Sometimes several times a day you check the stock market because it's more important to you than a relationship with God. You wouldn't call that an idol? I know a fellow. A number of years ago, he had a, a two-door Chevy Monte Carlo. That's what it was. A Chevy Monte Carlo. He washed that car every single day, summer and winter. I think he had, at that time, uh, maybe 140,000 miles on it. That thing looked brand new. Now, I would not tell him that that car was an idol. But I'm almost guaranteed he thought more about that car than he did about spending an equal amount of time in God's work. <coughs> what idols do you have? What things do you have uh, rising up that takes your attention? I know folks like your boss who preached motorcycles, they preach sports. They know every statistic about every baseball player that's ever played the game. Uh, what did God say about this? I don't know. <laughs> that became their idol. Okay, in Revelation here. Let me see if I got it. Oh, okay. 
and all liars shall have their... Oh, no! All liars! I wish they wouldn't put that in there! I, go to the door. If they're, if they're asking for me, tell them I'm not here. But that would be a lie. Yeah, that's a lie. <laughs> I heard about a gentleman who named one of the rooms in his house Tulsa. Sign over the entrance to the room, Tulsa. If the phone rang and it was for him and he didn't want to take the call, he'd rush in that room Tell him I'm in Tulsa. <laughs> it's a lie. Yeah, but it's just a little white lie. Your words have condemned you. It is a lie. The Alpha and the Omega first and the last said there will not be in heaven liars. Whoa! Yeah, slap your mouth, get on your knees, and repent. You know the best way to quit telling lies? When one of them escapes your mouth, Stop right then. Say, I just lied to you. <laughs> Would you please forgive me? Go! Oh, you do that a couple of times, you quit lying. <laughs> a friend of mine worked in building construction. Everybody knew he was a Bible thumper. Well, that's what they called him. This guy's working and doing whatever, laying out a stairway or something. And one of the co-workers on that building was just cussing up the blue street. And he stepped around the corner and saw my friend. Oh, I'm sorry. If I'd known you were here, I wouldn't have said that. My friend said, God hears you talk like that all the time. Oh, well, he does. You're not going to get away with anything. They shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's another part of one of those deceptions in the world today. Oh, there's no such thing as hell. There's no such thing as heaven. There is no devil. That's just something people made up. You going to stake your eternal destiny on that? You better not. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1. Now, that's right now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving, or deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What's he talking about there? If you continue with lying, eventually it becomes easier and easier and easier and it no longer seems to be a sin to you. When you were a little kid and you stole uh, a sucker from the store and got away with it, oh, you were so, you were shaking in your boots. If somebody caught me, oh my goodness, my mom would kill me. But after you get away with it, then the next time it's easier and easier. 
but it doesn't stay soccer as it finally goes to some other things and other things and finally you decide you want somebody else's car. Your conscience has become seared and what is sin no longer seems like sin. You need heavenly surgery to remove the calluses and soften up yourself. The scripture speaks about breaking up the fallow ground, the ground which is not ready to receive seed. Break it up! So that the seed of God's word will find a place to grow. The seed is the word of God. If it finds good soil, it will spring up. First the blade, then the ear, and then the full kernel in the ear, and then it's harvest time. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for your faithfulness in speaking to us.